Three, two, one. Hi, this is William Ramsey. Welcome to William Ramsey Investigates. On tonight's show, I have a very special guest, a researcher. His name is John Brisson, and he has been researching this very strange cult case that's referred to as the Finders case. Um, it's a group that actually had a very, they almost avoided being named, but uh, they came, a uh, name that they've been has been applied to them is known as the Finders, and it really came to the public attention after an arrest that took place in Tallahassee, Florida in 1987, where two men were found with six children who had bug bites, they were oblivious to modern technology, and seemed to be operating with these kind of rewards. But uh, it really started off an investigation, and John can tell us more about that. John, are you there? Yes, I am, William. Uh, thank you for having me on. I'm, I'm a huge fan of your show. Oh, thanks. Um, and uh, I, I have not read your book yet on the West, West Memphis Free, but I definitely am going to get a copy of it. Well, it's uh, an, that's an sure. interesting ride. That's one that maybe is a lot like this case where you kind of start peeling back the onion and it just, there's many, many, many layers. It gets deeper and deeper. But, uh, you know, this case is much like that. It started off with this one kind of arrest that took place with uh, two men were arrested and it just led down multi-state jurisdictions back to D.C., back to rural Virginia. But maybe you can start off and tell the listeners a little bit about your background and how you became interested in the subject and then how this arrest led to the, the, the discovery of this strange group. Yeah, um, my name is uh, John Brisson. I'm actually, uh, my day job, uh, I'm a, a naturopathic author and consultant. I wrote the book Fix Your Gut, and I've always been... Interesting, uh, interested in conspiracy ever since uh, Alex Jones uh, woke me up way back in 2009. Of course, I don't trust anything Alex Jones says now. <laughs> uh, but yeah, I I, uh, I came across the fighters myself uh, oh, about year year and a half ago, two years ago, when I was researching the Council for National Policy, and um, I noticed that a lot of people there's a lot of you know stuff going around about the fighters that. <sighs> Some of it was unsubstantiated. Some of it is substantiated. Um, and so I just started really looking into it and seeing, you know, if I could find all the newspaper clips and, you know, see if I can find the old um, uh, the, the customs report to read that. And then later I found the Tallahassee police report documents that someone had um, gotten through the Freedom of Information Act and then found the FBI documents that somebody had um, gotten from the um, – Freedom of, Freedom of Information Act, and then later I found out that it linked to the um, Glendale Monastery School case, James Towered, um, in the 80s that had researched and also had um, just many, many links that we're going to talk about when we talk about the finders and uh, Marion Petty's uh, very interesting life um, over over the years. Um, but yeah, to start with um, uh, what everybody, most people know um, that was reported um, in the news um and on uh, February 4, 1987, a concerned citizen notified by the, notified the Tallahassee Police Department um, that he had observed six children playing in Myers Park. Um, the children, of course, like you mentioned earlier, were poorly dressed. They were bruised. They were dirty, and they were behaving like wild animals. And they were accompanied by uh, two well-dressed uh, men. Um, of course, many of the finders' men, they always wore suits. Um, and Toby Terrell mentions in his book, um, as so does uh, Jordan Arico, one of the uh, little girls that we talk about later, that the finders women would doll themselves up um, for professional jobs um, as well. So they would wear, you know, very nice clothing, but their children would not, you know, they would wear heavy downs and look like wild animals. Hmm. Um, so uh, both uh, uh, Douglas Edward Ammerman, who was 27 at the time, and Michael James Hallwell, uh, who uh, went by the alias Houlihan, uh, was 28. Um, they both claimed that they were teachers, and they were en route to a school for brilliant children in um, Mexico. Um, the mothers of the children had later stated uh, that they were unaware that the children might be taken to school, f uh, that they were going to be taken from a, taken to the school uh, in Mexico, though. Um, so when both uh, Hallowell and um, Ammerman were arrested, um, they were both became extremely evasive. And um, Hallowell refused to talk. He fainted. Um, they were just acting very theatrical. Now, supposedly there is a video out there, which Derek Bros talked about in his documentary. Um, there's also police reports that it was uh, filmed, but I have not said, said, seen said video. Um, so if anybody has that video or... Uh, 
knows the gentleman uh, that has filmed it, I would love to see it. Right. Um, but yeah, they had multiple aliases. Uh, we'll talk about what they found in the um, 1979 uh, Dodge Sportsman blue van that had Virginia plates that they were traveling the kids in this kind of broken down kind of, you know, shaggy van. And um, so the children um, that were found, there were six of them. Um, there was uh, Max Livingstone, who uh, was a male who's age of six, uh, Galen uh, Ben Knoth, he was four. Uh, James, James Michael Hollowell III, who was two years old. Honey B. Evans, who was three years old. B.B. Said, who was three years old. And Jordan Messino Arico, who was the oldest uh, girl. She was uh, six years old. Um, so, yeah, they were, you know, Ammerman and Hollowell were traveling around. Uh, they claimed that they were going to some school in Mexico, which the investigative journalist Charles Soka said they were going down to. Oh, what was the, um, there was a Jesuit priest that had a school down in Mexico. I think it was called like CCDOC, Mm -hmm. um, that they were traveling. Supposedly that's where they were going to travel to. Um, Ivian Illich, uh, was his name. He was very popular in modernizing a lot of, uh, homeschooling that we have today. Um, that the council for national policy is very big and that was supposedly the school that they were going to allegedly. Um, but I was not been able, I was not able to verify that though. Um, outside of what Soka had claimed. Um, do you want to go through a few of the curious things that were found in the van? Yes, that absolutely. Were labeled Very Dallas strange. Police, yes. Police report. Um, there was, you know, a bunch of food. You know, the kids uh, and the, most of the finders were pretty much vegetarians for the most part. A um, whole bunch of dirty clothes, you know, stuff that you expect people traveling in a van would have. But they also had some weird things, too, like a brown bag containing 20 floppy disks. Uh, their program discs, they were not databases, Radio Shack calculator, Radio Shack TRS-80 computer uh, with keyboard, um, battery-operated spotlight, uh, Chinese-English dictionary, uh, Douglas and Michael's passports, a uh, brand canvas bag containing subdued photos of children, um, Trojan condoms, a piece of paper t- t- titled The Ballad of Ballads uh, was found in the van that referenced the, the Washington, D.C. warehouse of the finders. A house in the mountains, Miami, Hawaii, San Diego, and China, which were all locations that the finders were known to go to. Um, so, yeah, there was really weird things that were found in the van. Of course, later when we talk about how everybody says that the finder's case was a witch hunt um, and that, you know, the, the, the children were taken care of. And there was maybe if you look at the customs report, some people say that Ramon J. Martinez's customs report is outlandish and a lot of its claims. The Tallahassee police report, which is about the closest that you're going to get to being on the ground, the closest that you're going to get to the truth, they mentioned that there were new photos of children in a brown paper bag. Gotcha. So, so remember, uh, or a brown canvas bag, should I say. So remember that. Right. That's, that, that's weird. Right. So, um, I mean, it set off an investigation. Once this was discovered, it became a larger issue because there was multi-state involvement. This guy from the customs uh, depart- US- USCS Ramon Martinez got involved and the, and started the, the the tendrils of the relationship between these guys and the finders started being investigated, going to D.C. and Virginia, correct? Yes, and also we, curious enough, too, is apparently there was a second van hmm. um, that no one has talked about, um, to my knowledge, um, because they found a second TRS-80 computer that was located in a phone booth on the Florida State University cal- campus by Tallahassee Police, employee in communications section Robert J. Sorkine. Um, he was a student, um, and he gave it, uh, I think, to the Tallahassee Police uh, and uh, Tallahassee Police Department officer Rick Huffman thought that there was a second group. Um, a message was found on the computer uh, from Fighters member Stuart uh, Silverstone um, that warning them about that, um, that, that they had been found. Um, and there was a, a, a witness later on who had mentioned that they had saw a second van. Um, which is interesting because if you read Toby Terrell's book and you read the police accounts, there were eight children in the finders. One was a boy, I believe, uh, named Walker, um, and that may have been his alias, who was um, also a member of the finders who was not on the trip, supposedly. But was he in that other van? Uh, were there any other children who were outside of the finders that were in said second van? Uh, I, I, I do not know. Um, but I do find that extremely interesting. And they tried to track down that second van and any leads. But again, as we talk about later, the case was shut down. Right. So that's, uh, I mean, but let's get to the point where they, so there's all these kind of 
at that time, that was kind of relatively recent tech, the TRS-80, yes. uh, 1987. Um, but they, 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 the people started, the, there was an investigation that went to Madison County, Virginia, and there were raids, warrants to raid other properties where there were found some very uh, interesting materials that were similar to what was found in the van, correct? Yeah, well, when we get to the warehouse okay. um, raid, which is the D.C., which is kind of separate um, from, from this, yes, there were. there were. That was where you get the general information from the customs report, which gotcha. is... Um, just, it's just, I mean, a lot of, none of the people don't realize too, that the children were taken to a safe house known as the tree house. And there was a bomb threat called on the tree house on February 7th, 1987, according to the Tallahassee police report. And the children were located by the sheriff's department, um, because of that bomb threat. So why, you know, why would the finders, if they were such an innocent organization, call it a bomb threat? I mean, maybe they didn't, but. You know, William, it is it no one's ever reported I didn't hear Bros talk about I don't remember did Bros talk about that in, in his no. documentary? No. I don't think he did. No. Um and I found that extremely interesting. Um so yeah, I mean, uh Jay of course, you know, Bros did talk about this. Uh, Jane Patella of um Florida HRS and Dr. Moore did examine the children for potential abuse. Uh they made a statement that Jordan and Max examination findings were consistent with sexual abuse. John Paul had many uh, old bruises and bite marks, and the bite marks appeared to be human. Uh, Dr. Moore mentioned that Max Lynx lacked uh, anal sphincter control consistent with previous sodomy. Now, again, that could have been just because of their diet, uh, just to put it out there. Um, he didn't he didn't mention any anal tearing or anal bruising or anything like that that you see in a lot of molestation cases. Um, but... I, you know, it doesn't mean that it wasn't going on. It's just that there wasn't, you know, with McMartin, you had a little bit of stronger physical, you know, physiological anat anatomy evidence. Right. Um, in this case, it's not as strong. Uh, just like they mentioned that Jordan, uh, her right hymen was absent, but they did mention that she had an enlarged vaginal orifice, which is consistent with digital penetration. Um, of course, the mothers of the children denied any sexual abuse has ever gone on. Toby Terrell denied it, and um, Michael Hollowell, who had been arrested, who was the father of, Paul, of uh, Jordan Messino Arco, um, may have been the father, um, or at least the adopted father, um, and, and the father of James Michael Hollowell III, um, who was known as John Paul Pope. Um, they, you know, claimed that nothing like that had ever had, had gone on. Where, where, were just, the, where were the mothers at the time that these kids were found? In? Uh, the fathers were, and we'll talk about that too. The okay. fathers of the fighters cult were who took care of the children after about the age of three. Mm -hmm. The mothers would be sent off to the, the warehouse in San Francisco to do, um, like, work in offices and write articles and stuff like that, be editors and stuff. So they'd be separate away from the children completely. Um, and would not see them very often at that age. Interesting. Um, so um, now you're going to find this really interesting with your knowledge of a lot of the quote unquote satanic panic cases, sexual abuse cases in the 1980s that everybody liked to say are satanic panic, but we know um, that they're not. There's a lot of evidence at the bare minimum that child abuse had occurred. At the most, it was ritual satanic abuse, which I believe was the case. Uh, if anybody hasn't read the book, uh, The Witch Hunt Narrative by Rossi Chet, I'd recommend uh, reading that book. It's a very, very, very lengthy book um, to, to reference uh, the truth in a lot of these cases when it comes to molestation. Uh, but Dr. Damon H. Greenberg, uh, he was flown in from the Chicago area to interview the children to see if they had been sexually abused. Uh, Damon Greenberg uh, charged a Florida um, human, uh, the, the resource center. Uh, $168,000 was offered nine contracts for his work on the finder's case for consulting to improve Florida's response and training to handle sexual abuse after, after the finder's case. Mm -hmm. um, of course, uh, HS, HRS Secretary Gregory L. Kohler, who had also knew Greenberg back in Chicago, he came under a lot of fire uh, for that. Now, very interesting enough, if, you, if it was, you know, Naaman H. Greenberg had just had been part of the finder's cult, you uh, investigation to determine whether or not the children had been abused you kind of just overlooked that but when he was the champion for the defense for the big martin preschool case wow yeah that's incredible uh, so he shows was, up in and, this case and then mcmartin it was later also part of the jewish community center case 
1984. Which one was that? I don't remember. The VCC, uh, the Jewish Community Center, uh, the demolitions had occurred there uh, yeah. too as well. It's very, very longly detailed in um, um, Rossi Chet's books that uh, it had it had occurred. Had molestation occurred, yeah. at least had occurred. But there were apparently implications too of satanic uh, ritual abuse in the JCC as well. Interesting. Um, but yes, so of course, you know, Greenberg tanks the Jewish Community Center case, you know, helps to really try to put a strain on uh, McFarland's credibility. Uh, Key McFarland, who was the um, the therapist who was going through the kids at McMartin, mm -hmm. you know, kind of really, you know, kind of try to really make, even though Ray Bucky was convicted but later you know it was reversed right i think um, the case was thrown out and then they retried him right that yeah that's right that's right that's right yeah you're right um he he was involved in that and he was involved in the jewish community center case so he helped get that done as well he also helped you know it was finally and dr greenberg's conclusion that there was no abuse was found in the finders uh, case in tallahassee florida gotcha so, yeah, but I mean, it's interesting for, to bring him into this conversation because it shows the finders were part of this whole uh, child abuse um, phenomenon that really peaked right around that time in 19, 1980s. And I have no idea why no one ever, ever's mentioned that. No one, to my knowledge. Yeah. Um, and it's in the Tallahassee Police Report that they referenced Dr. Naaman Inch Greenberg. It's in multiple articles from from the tallahassee paper yeah. but yet no one ever looked into him and i mean it's odd. odd it is it is i mean especially when you connect all him being part of all three things and you know and then him you know he also founded a, a causes child abuse unit for studies education and services at the illinois masonic hospital uh back in 1975 at that time so he was looked at as an expert for all these cases in a lot of ways right interesting Super, really fascinating. So, and then, I mean, there's there's evidence these kids are are they're not from Florida, right? Are they from Virginia? No, 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 no. They were not. They lived. Uh, they were all. They all the kids were uh, at least these kids. We don't know about any other kids. Um, these kids were members of the Finders. Technically, their parents were in the Finders. Um, they lived in an area uh, called Paradise um, that was uh, near the free area. Uh, it was in Virginia that uh, Petty had owned. It was kind of near the, uh, the city, uh, or I guess town, uh, Nethers, Virginia. Um, and they, the kids lived in this area called uh, Paradise. And um, so you, you read a lot about in the um, Tallahassee Police Report about how the kids were taken care of and how, like you mentioned earlier, they didn't know what simple appliances were. And, you know, that they, they were fed really poor vegetarian meals, you know, and Toby Terrell writes it in his book that the kids are like, well, it's a new type of parenting we parenting that we were doing and lots about how important it was and everything. But the kids pretty much, they lived out in the wild while the parents lived in cabins on these properties. And some of the cabins were, ran down, you know, ran down or Petty lived in quote unquote, the red cabin, which was nice. Or they lived in the warehouse, which was nice back in DC, you know, and they pretty much let the kids, you know, the parents didn't really talk to the kids. They let, you know, it, 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 right. they, they, they would get down on their knees to, to interact with the children and they wore special knee pads because of it. Uh, Mary and Petty never really met the children except for one time where Ronald, um, Allman, who was mentioned in the report, um, by Jordan Arico, uh, that, um, he, she would take him down to like the basement cause they were, cause you know, the, you hear a lot about basements when it comes to a lot of the satanic ritual abuse, whether it's McMartin preschool uh, or even in this case, the finders. And it seems to me that the, the Tallahassee police department and uh, the DC Metro police, they were trying to figure out um, what about these basements? You know, why would right. they take the kids down to these basements? What about the basements? And, and Jordan did not want to talk about it. She didn't want to talk about the basements. She didn't want to talk about Ronald Allman very much. His nickname was lucky. He was ex green beret. Um, they didn't want to talk about him. So the first time they met Petty, they like uh, Ronald Allman like put all these candles out like around this area that was near, like making a little island around uh like this near this miniature lake. Okay, so they like they met him as like a god figure, 
you know, and Jordan Araco talks about her, him in that reference of how he's a game caller and how he's like, seems to be the boss and they don't really see him, you know? And so it's weird how the fighters, you know, they're all like, it's, it's this weird way they took care of the, the, the children. It's not normal. Not normal, but it's also kind of classic cult behavior where you remove the kids from their parents, you know? And yeah, I mean, they weed, they, they weaned them from their mothers. Um, get, cause you know, Toby Terrell talks about it in his book, uh, that they weaned, um, was two of the children, I think it was Honey Bee and, uh, and Ben Knopf, uh, weaned them too early and they would cry for their mothers, just cry for them. But yet they just thought it was that, you know, the mothers had to go work over there at San Francisco or whatever. And so they weaned them at the age of like around the age of two which you know with breastfeeding sometimes moderately that's normal but to keep them completely away from their mothers though that's not normal very odd so i mean the the investigation after it completes in tallahassee it moves to dc and virginia well it was going it was going on at the same time it was going on at the same time uh i believe that the tallahassee police department and the dc metro police did their best i believe that it was shut down and we'll talk about why by the FBI, and later when it was reopened, was shut down by the CIA, uh, when it was reopened by the State Department. Um, and I do think that, again, I really, I've, now, we haven't seen the, des- this is, you might find it interesting, we haven't found the D.C. Metro, been able to get a hold of the D.C. Metro police files, William, Got because it. they are classified secret. It's amazing that they're even classified. So that's evidence uh, or an indicator that something regarding state involvement is, is happening. So the D.C. Metro Police were classified secret report. So I really want to know what's in those reports because yeah. the D.C. Police, they thought they, – they were investigating the fighters even beforehand. Um, right. They were like investigating they were they were shooting pornography at the warehouse. Right. Uh, one of the detectives thought they were shooting child pornography at the warehouse allegedly. I mean they were being investigated long before – the Tallahassee incident. Right, but that, the but DC the DC thing DC. is is that what happened in Madison County, so even outside of DC, there was evidence of a satanic ritual, there are pictures of kids and the, ritual about slaughter the execution of, the go- of Henrietta and Igor, the goats. Right, correct. And they found child pornography. So this is, you know, there's a consistent element of of illegality in all these in this child porn going on, and it reminded me the blood ritual like the kids are involved and slaughtering goats, and it was actually admitted by Toby Terrell that it happened, but he kind of... Yes, but he says it was a way to teach them hands-on, natural butchering that would have been done 125, you know, 200 years ago, which is all fine and dandy. That's a nice spin, yeah, it's hard. Yeah, yeah, it really is. I mean, that's the thing is, is, look, I get it that, like... I, I try to be objective as much as I possibly can, William. I really do. But it's very difficult. It's extremely difficult in this case once you see all the connections, and I'm still not done yet finding them the slightest bit, of who the finders were. It's almost impossible to take almost anything that they say a basic narrative at face value. Right, right. I agree, totally agree with that. And how did they got their name? Can you describe how they got this term? They really didn't have a public uh you know associated name like scientology or anything they just became it because of their central uh, central figure marion petty and how, what he talked about what they did right yeah i mean they would just find information so they, they were, were part of a network yeah they were part of a network and they would do weird things to get information they would go on to newspapers and be you know advertised for babysitting and all kinds of stuff and just Gather information on people, and they would, and, and you know, of course, um, Mary Ann Petty's wife, Isabel Petty, worked for the Central Intelligence Agency, the CIA. Right. Um, uh, his son uh, worked for, um, oh, was it was it David Petty? Uh, he worked for Air America. I can't remember right. if it was David Petty or George Perry, Petty that worked for um, Air, Air America. America. I think it was David, total think it was David Petty that worked yeah. for Air America. Um, but yeah, you know, the Air America, of course, you know, yeah, it's just. It's just they, he was so in, in, in just entranced with the intelligence organization. And then for Toby Terrell in his book to be like, ah, P- Petty wasn't part of it. And then for uh, uh, the investigator um, that, that leaked out the investigated leads memo, um, I want to get his name right real quick. 
Uh, he was, Ed and I talked about him on the Offerman podcast, Daniel Brandt. Uh, he started NameBase, which is a web-based cross-index database of right. names and, and stuff like that for intelligence agency and stuff. He was pretty much like, like, like Wendell Minnick, like everybody but me and Charles Soka, which Charles Soka is now pretty much being like, there's something, there's something wrong. He actually knew the finders. I mean, he dated um, Dave Petty's ex-wife. Like he was part of the finders to some degree and in relations with them, but he couldn't stand them. Um, he he's kind of changed. You know, he's kind of changed his mind before where he was like, there's maybe something here to, yeah, there seems more and more like there's something here with right. the information I'm giving him. Can but you, Wendell can Minnick, you expl- just a sec, can you explain yeah. who Wendell Minnick was, please? Uh, he was an author who wrote an encyclopedia on spies and I want to get a copy of it. I cannot think of the name specifically. Spies and provocateurs. He, yeah. Spies and provocateurs. Do you have a copy of it? No. Okay. Um, I, I can want to get one for ten bucks, but yes, he investigated the finders in the mid '90s um, and published an article, "The Finders, the CIA, and the Cult of Mary and David Petty." Um, but uh, yeah, he he claimed, you know, again that they were up to no good with their CIA connections, but everything else, as far as satanic panic, like in that in that or satanic ritual abuse, should I say, in that regard, he kind of played the, the narrative, the satanic panic, and said the satanic abuse didn't happen. You know, and that's right, the same thing right. with Daniel Brandt. It's like, okay, like, you, you, I've done so much research on this case that there's no, in my mind, there's about 99% chance that majority of the things that were in Ramon J. Martinez's customs report were true. True, right. Even though Ramon, Ramon J. Martinez, I mean, he's there's some things that are questionable in his background as well, but I do think, you know, that, he was he was in and and his partner um Bob Harold you know he became a truther um it's just i don't know it's when you look at okay so there was a woman her name was uh, Athena uh, Verionis she was worked for the FBI she was uh, the inspiration for Clarice Starling and Silence of the Lambs oh interesting okay mm-hmm. She was the FBI agent that handled the finder's case and pretty much was like, I'll take care of you. And Toby Terrell talk, calls her, uh, you know, his goddess Athena in his book, The Game Caller. Gotcha. And she was the first FBI liaison for NECMEC. What's NECMEC? National Center for Missing and Exploited Children. Okay. Which I've done a lot of research in NECMEC, and they are extremely very, very, very shady. <laughs> okay. Um, I will go into that on my own podcast. We've read the documents because it would take me an hour to explain why Deck Neck is, is shady. But once you start looking into it, um, and their connections with you know the United States government, they get funding for the government and everything, right. and their connections to Microsoft and Microsoft DNA to look at you know they pretty much house they pretty much house a lot of the child pornography that they found in the net and they catalyze catalog it using Microsoft DNA. But who's watching the Watchers, William? Good question. Well, I can do, go going back to Ramon Martinez. He believed in his information so much that he sent it to Congress. So he was trying to find an uh, end around after this whole investigation got shut down and stalled. The more I've done the research in this case, the more I respect Ramon, Ramon J. Martinez. Yeah, he was really serious really to try to get it out. Yeah. And 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 I do think that and and the thing is is, is um, uh, Athena. She claims that Ramon faked all that because he was jealous of her because he's a sexist. Oh, that's a good one. That's that sounds that sounds actually very, uh, very like a recent type of excuse. You know, it sounds like she might have been the inventor of that. The, rea- <laughs> the reality is, is that he came upon it independently. You know, he was brought in because there were multi jurisdiction. So I yeah. think he was right there at the beginning. So it's kind of silly that. Uh, but then, but then again, you know, like they always say, no one corroborates Ramon J. Martinez's uh, memo. Right, well, uh, none of the D.C. officers, none of the FBI agents that were involved, no one that was involved corroborates it but him. Um, but the, uh, the other materials that was found in, found in Madison does corroborate uh, the certain factual relationship. Well, I, I can corroborate most of what. Ramon J. Martinez said, just based off my knowledge of the, the finders and their, and you know, you know, for example, you know, he talks about Stuart Miles Silverstone 
you know, being um, at the apartment, and he was part of the finders. And I mean, I the more I've done research on this, the more I believe that a majority of the customs document. Because that's the thing is, I went into this saying, what can I verify, William? Right. And any good investigator could do that. I, you can't take anything at face value. Even if it, trust me, I want to believe almost everything that I uncovered is true. But you still have to look at it objectively and say, well, does this match up with this? Does this match up with this? Right. The more I've done research, the more I can conclude that the customs report on Ramon J. Martinez was accurate. Gotcha. And what they found at the warehouse as far as, you know, alleged possible child pornography filming of child pornography which the dc metro police thought that they were doing um telexes of of children to the uh, chinese embassy in hong kong which by the way when the case was reopened by state department in the the early 90s uh by because skip clemens got involved and we'll talk about skip clemens hopefully okay um they were investigating the fighters for white, white white slave trafficking Right, and there were. That's there were what commu- it says on the release right. documents. Right, there were there were documents, they were in communication using kind of uh, really beginning, you know, telex type things. But some With of the closed notes... message boards similar to uh, one Hillary Rodham Clinton, huh? Or, or, <laughs> like, yeah. like a closed system that closed they were dialing si- into. Yeah, <laughs> dial, it was a dial-in system pre-internet, but they were sending stuff about, you know, we're going to pick up the kids. I think there was an order for kids from China, right? Yeah, there was. That was found in the the warehouse, uh, the customs report. Um, yes, and and again, you know, the area that the warehouse was in, it was four miles away from the Sheridan Caloroma neighborhood where Craig Spence, the DC madam. Right. You know, yeah. well, I guess not DC madam. I guess Harry Benson was a DC madam, but Craig right. Spence was running, you know, above him, a step above uh, Harry Benson. Right. Um, but yeah, you know, so it was in that general area. It's like it's all it's weird. It's all in the general area, like like the houses, the finders' houses are all in the general area of, of where, you know, they claim with with PizzaGate. And I have, you know, I I do believe that there is some truth in PizzaGate. There's some there's some falsities too. It was put out by Roger Stone and the Council for National Policy. A lot of it, you know, it's kind of to throw shade. They couldn't, you know, neither Clinton or Trump could go with Epstein, you know. So they kind of well, like well, right. Good point. They did not bring him up during the the uh, the election. So instead, they were like, "Let's go with WikiLeaks and let's release, you know, the information. You know, look at this. Don't right. look at what we've done. Look at this." Well, okay. Pizzagate, not to say there isn't truth right. in this it. This is true. PizzaGate came out of WikiLeaks. It was WikiLeaks and the Podesta emails. And there's some there's supposedly involvement with Roger Stone in as well, which was reported years ago. By oh man, I can't think of the name of the investigative journalist, uh, Yoshi Shirabatsu. Um, yes. And yes. I, and, and as much as I want to say that's fake, as much as I've looked into it, it appears to be correct. Correct, right? Well, not the, to say there isn't truth in it. Again, it's just you know, here's some, here's a lot of truth. Here's a few lies to get you stuck on, and you know, don't look at us. Look at this. Well, the Pizzagate was never just like the finders never properly investigated by the authorities no. not at all but inside of podesta's emails there are all of these connections between him and his brother and Oliphant and the art and, and the, the, the connections to the lozado farm and Antonis, the lozado children right Antonis, the, lo- the emails lo- that said i have a map with a handkerchief on top of checkerboards all the coded language can I, can I can I can I disprove one email though while sure. I'm here on my own research sure. while we're talking about it? <laughs> sure. Um, the walnut sauce. I really honestly believe that um, John Podesta was talking about pasta because there is a walnut sauce and it's you know it's an Italian walnut sauce pasta sauce. Well, you can that look might it up be yourself. fair, but the the preponderance of pizza references. Oh, very much so. Dogs. Very much so. It's right. just the walnut sauce is one of the only things where I think people got too much of a lead on. That's well, that all. might be fair. Well, thank God people got that wrong. That means they're probably not pedophiles because it sounded like coded language. And no, I know. I know. I, well, I mean, I do think that Podesta and his brother are <laughs> more than likely alleged pedophiles. And, you know, Al and this was going on. But just that specific email, there is a walnut pasta sauce. It's Fine. very well but, known. Yeah, but that doesn't disprove anything else that was in there. Oh, no, 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 no. Not at all. Not at all. They are just in like... contact. The Podesta brothers are in contact with Hastert, crossing party Oh, lines. yeah. 
Yeah, I mean, I so mean, these are these are very serious things that were never properly. Laid oh, out. And not the only at all. People get it. And the fact that Roger Stone and Jerry Corsi and all these other people were waiting on the uh, the WikiLeaks emails that were probably stolen by Seth Rich, not leaked, and they're still repeating that lie that not, they were actually hacked by Russia. Which is no, there's actually no evidence for that. Well, I mean, it was through a phishing scam. You know, Possessor's password was runner one two three four, if I remember correctly. Well, that might be it. That might be it. But my understanding is that the, I mean, Seth Rich is involved in this. But they're never. I mean, in the whole thing with the uh, Abramovich and the blood rituals yeah. and all that stuff. Yeah. Those guys were interested, but everybody else on Earth was interested in the WikiLeaks leaks, and they were signaled by Julian Assange be- before the 2016 election. So to say that these guys and implicate these two guys in some type of Russian uh, leak is a, just a total farce and a fraud. But I do it. think it, it, I do think it was put on to discredit Hillary Clinton. Of course, you know, she deserves it, but in a way that did not discredit Trump. No doubt. I don't think there's any doubt. They were hammering the WikiLeaks revelations two or three days before the election on Infowars with Roger Stone. Every right-wing asset was was promoting and bullhorning all of that dark stuff, the the spirit cooking and all this crap like that. So and also and also one last thing you've heard you've seen uh, Podesta do that have like the scars on his on his hands. Absolutely. In his emails, I can't remember the exact medical condition, and I will get back to you with it. Podesta referenced that he has a medical condition where his hands are contractured that would require surgery to give those exact scars on his hands. Interesting. That is another form of misinformation. Through my own research that I've determined. That's and it's fair. in the WikiLeaks e- emails that he has this medical condition and that he was getting surgery for it. And those scars would be exactly where he got the surgery. You know that his nickname is Skippy and that he used to work on a farm where he would take pigs and cut them in half. Yep. So, yeah. Yep. So, you know, I mean, I, look, I'm not saying that Pizza Gate is not real. Yeah. I'm not saying that James Alphonse is. I'm just saying that, you know, there, there is some parts of it, just like everything. I might get things about the Finders case wrong, okay? But there's things, there's certain things that are, that are constantly put out there in the ether that through my own research, you know, I'm not, you know, people are sitting there and saying I'm a Pizza Gate denialist now, which is farther from the well, truth. Well, these are just <laughs> ridiculous labels that don't have any meaning. Yeah. Um, but uh, all right, so let's get back to the finders. Um, so, um, the warehouse itself, like you'd mentioned, I mean, there was, there, they had files of information of different places. Um, they eventually found passports, uh, to North Korea, for example. Wow, <laughs> Why would they have access to North Korea in the late nineties? Yeah. <laughs> Vietnam, you know? So it, it's just crazy, you know? Crazy. It, Super sketchy stuff going back. And it all leads back to the central character of the Finders, Marion uh, Buford Petty, and who also known as the Game Caller. Yes, because he would call games. You know, it was just like kind of like the Mad Hatter, where he'd be like, uh, "Just go somewhere, leave, drop everything you know, and just go somewhere, or go to China, or go to Colorado, or go to Hawaii, and try to survive there, and don't come back till you make a hundred dollars." Right. Know? Yeah, that's what. Uh... Terrell said in, in his interview was he... That's what he said in his book, too. Okay. So, um, and let's talk about Petty, Marion Petty and how his background and how he went from the military as a so-called chauffeur, which probably a cover, to uh, infiltrating kind of the nascent countercultural movement. Well, most of that information we have comes from Toby Terrell's book, The Game Caller, and from a, 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 an investigative leads memo. Um, which I've verified to seem, you know, pretty much true. And then again, also uh, Daniel Brandt also said it seemed to be true as well, as much as you could trust Daniel Brandt. But it does seem to be correct in that, you know, Petty had connections to the OSS. A lot of, you know, Petty said himself that a lot of OSS officers would uh, go live in the apartments that he had during World War II. You know, they 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 come, you know. So yeah, it's just it, it, all his connections that he has with OSS. And then, you know, he was a chauffeur. Um, uh, for, you know, many different generals, um, Ira Aker, uh, he was, uh, for many different presidents before they were president, like Dwight D. Eisenhower, uh, Lyndon Baines Johnson, um, and, and Toby Terrell talked a lot about that in his book, and it was also in the investigated leads memo too as well. Um, so he was, you know, you know, he was, when he was a chauffeur, he was driving around very, very important people. Right. And so he, now Petty claims that he got his money 
from being really, really good at card games. Interesting. And he just saved his money and was able to buy vast, vast amounts of land in the Virginia area and property. Yeah, like 600 think, acres and houses and stuff. I think it's, I think it's bull crap. Right. Like everything else, there's a cover story. That's all the elements of an Intel op is just mythical rationales for everything. And you put them all together and they're all just transparent. You know, I they, mean, they make you know, Toby Terrell says that he was just able to save his money. He just saved his money and yeah, played was, card games. And yeah, I just got made a lot of money when I was young. And next, next thing you know, I'm supporting this cult. Yeah. I mean, but again, you know, in the investigative leads, you know, it talks about that he gotten his, his money from, you know, pretty much people that were within this network, you know, to be able to buy those properties. Okay. So, you know, and I think, I think it was Charles E. Marsh who, from, you know, he ended up giving him money um, for it. And so, yeah, that, so he started buying, you know, the fighters group started buying all these properties, you know, like, the, you know, information, like not information, um, properties in Virginia, near Nethers, Virginia, uh, he called the free state where all these hippies went to and, uh, he said, was set out their own properties and Petty put cabins up there. And later, you know, the finders kids would stay in that general area. Uh, they bought two warehouses that we know of, uh, one in San Francisco, um, and one in the W warehouse in, um, Washington DC that was raided multiple properties, uh, the W street apartments. Um, I mean, just so you know, he held so many, and a lot of that property was bought by Toby Terrell, uh, for the finders group. Um, so which Toby Terrell himself, you, you know, was a former, um, IRS agent. Um, so Petty was involved with, I mean, who do you want to talk? I mean, yeah, Timothy Leary. Um, let's talk about his involvement with Timothy Leary. I mean, he was part of the human potential movement, which I think Leary was part of Huxley was part of Yep. all these, all these kind of big wigs. T- Timothy Leary said that he met, I mean, Mary Petty said that he met Timothy Leary. Um, uh, I mean, there, there was a guy who was connected to Timothy Leary that, um, Toby Terrell talks in his book, um, that he, uh, one of, uh, Petty's houses burned down. Um, but he doesn't say who or why why it was, but Petty actually talks about an interview that he did, uh, with Ken Thomas and Lynn Bracken that it was burned up uh, during an LSD trip with this kid that was connected to Timothy Leary. Um, so, and, uh, and, and then you are also probably aware of, oh, who was the, who was the pilot? Oh, that was associated with Leary. The pilot. Uh, uh, he he was supposedly, according to the investigated leads memo, he was, uh, he knew Petty as well. I can't think of oh, his name. Are you talking about Fletcher Prouty? No, it uh-huh. wasn't Fletcher Prouty. It was some other, I can't uh-huh. think of it. But yeah. Barry so, Seal? Barry Seal? No. No, it wasn't Barry Seal. That was drug running uh-huh. later on. Um, I, don't know who the, I don't know which pilot you're talking about. And what, where was the pilot? What was his related? What was he notorious for? He was um, Timothy Leary's pilot. Oh, okay. I, I don't know. I don't even know who his pilot but was. But he was apparently possibly running uh, psychedelics and stuff. Oh. Well, I wouldn't be surprised. I mean, Leary provided... He's someone psych- famous. As soon as I say his name, you'd be like, yeah, oh, you gotcha. should know who he is. But I cannot think of him for the life of me. But yeah, I mean, it's just... With all the connections that Leary had to all these people, and into the OSS, into the CIA, and all these intelligence officers, and um, uh, uh, it was Walt Snyder. He was Timothy Leary and Billy Hitchcock's private pilot. Right, and Hitchcock was Mellon family. Uh, what what was the place that they had up the, the Millbrook, right? Millbrook yeah, Estate. Yeah. Right. yeah. So you know, being a part with all this group and being a part with a part of, you know, he was, um, no, you know, no one, I don't have no idea also why Derek Bronze didn't bring, bring it up in his, in his movie, but, um, Mary and Petty was, uh, very, very, very good friends with, uh, Patch Adams. Interesting. Um, and, you know, Patch Adams went to him to get his money, uh, to, to, to build the Gazuntide Institute, his children's hospital, um, which, uh, Mary and Petty had, um, turned down. Um, so yeah, I mean, I mean, 
Who is Petty? Who is Petty not involved with? Right. Well, that's the odd thing. And the other thing is that he's very much cloak and dagger. There's very few pictures of him with all these important people that he knew. Yeah, there's hardly any pictures of him. Period. Right. So with that in itself is sketchy. He's always and he also like walked at ten or twenty miles a day. Just very odd. And a lot of. Uh, you know, uh, he would just take flights as a former army officer out of Andrews Air Force Base and yeah, go wherever he wants to go. The, yeah, just disappear, show up. Yeah, very strange. I mean, he was connected also to, to Roy Mason, who was an architect who was part of the uh, World Future Society, which, of course, World Future Society includes uh, Buck Mr. Fuller, who's a famous architect, and Gene Roddenberry, and Ray Kurzweil, and Carl Sagan, Neil deGrasse Tyson. So anyway, Mason got his degree at uh, architecture at Yale University. It was called the Mad Foamer because he would spray a Eurofoam foam everywhere <laughs> and oh, make these like geodesic domes and stuff. And uh, Charles Soaker, the investigative reporter, he talked about how um, Mason, uh, you know, pretty much he 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 had a, he was a pedophile allegedly. Um, and Toby Trout talks about in his book about how he was dating a transsexual uh, that um, who. Uh, dropped a cigarette in one of Mason's uh, garbage cans and burned down his house by accident. Hey. Um, but yeah, Mason actually worked for the uh, Washington, D.C. Children's Museum. Oh, yikes. Uh, so, yeah, I mean, what about, um, given someone recently, um, the Theodore Gerald Ress, he was part of the Finders. Um, and, uh, you know, he taught at Georgetown University. Of course, Georgetown University uh, wiped his uh, webpage biography. Because he was allegedly sentenced on Wednesday, May 10th, 2017 for distribution of child pornography hmm. over a peer-to-peer -peer network. He had 291 videos and 29 still images. Yikes. I mean, it's just like all these uh, crazy connections and stuff like that. A lot, of, a lot of the similar themes keep popping up, right? Yeah, I mean... One time, you might this this will go back to you because you recently uh, interviewed Roberta, Roberta Glass and her excellent information. It was a great interview. If anybody listening, you can go to listen to it on Dershowitz's case. Right. Uh, but in Pittsburgh during 1975, um, uh, Toby Terrell went to Pittsburgh and he uh, met Keith Ham, um, who was part of this new uh, Vernard Bon uh, Hare Krishna community. Well, a lot of them were implicated in racketeering, but they were also implicating in child, uh, allegedly child molestation, which eventually um, Keith Ham was convicted for. Uh, now, Terry Sheldon, which was part of this group, he was rep rep represented by um, Scientologist Greta Van Susteren, uh, who rep uh, later represented Harry Vinson and who sold him out, the D.C. madam. Uh, but uh, uh, funny and I got funny in quotation marks enough. Uh, Keith Ham was represented by Alan Morton Dershowitz, who was paid three million dollars for his wow. services. Who got everything, uh, uh, you know, all the uh, the racketeering charges, convictions returned, and saying that the child molesting evidence had been unfairly prejudiced the jury against Keith Ham. Wow, that's amazing. Of course, Keith Ham was later uh, charged into prison for for something else. But we were talking about that last night. We were saying. Alan Dershowitz has a history of uh, representing some very unsavory people, including... That's why I wanted to bring that right. up. Right. <laughs> so now you can just add to the list. Klaus von Bülow, OJ. Keith Ke Ham. Keith Ham, Jeffrey Epstein. I mean, holy smoke. I just, it, it just, it never ends. Yeah. It, it, just... it, it, ne it, it never ends. And Dershowitz is so, he's like 80 years old, so he's had decades to get, get involved in all types of different, uh, very curious cases, shall we say? Yeah, I just I have to, don't, don't even get me started on Dershowitz. Oh, I just, no. um, oh, but yeah. I mean, so two more things real quick on on the finders. Okay. Um, uh, James F. Hollowell, who was Michael Hollowell's father, um, he was in the finders as early as 1970s. Um, he eventually left the finders. He was part of Jim Fetzer's uh, Scholars for 9/11 Truth. He was associated member. Interesting. Oh, so this is the that. guy, the original person who was pulled over by police in Tallahassee. In no, 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 no. That was his father. That was his father. So the son of the original person yes. who was arrested is yes. now associated with Fetzer. Gotcha. No, no, no. The father was. He passed away. The father of Michael Hollowell who was arrested. Gotcha. Michael Hollowell's son was arrested. Gotcha. Okay, I understand. So he was—he um, was actually fairly old when he was associated with Fetzer, then, huh? 
Yes, he recently passed away. I mean, the thing about Hollowell is, is he seemed like I know he's part of the Finders and he was probably sketchy, okay? But he seemed like when I looked at his Facebook page, I looked at his Twitter. He seemed like an old man that 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 taught a lot of inner city people chess. So we're very grateful of him, and he's one of the few finders that was pro-Trump and a conspiracy theorist. The rest of them are extremely left-leaning liberals. Interesting. So, I mean, I'm not going to say that. I don't know anything about James F. L. I'm not going to make any accusations other than that he was part of the finders, and his son was later, of course, uh, Michael Hollowell was pulled over in Tallahassee. Um. And I'm not, you know, and I'm not gonna say that everybody who was in the finders or anybody, everybody who the finders had, had ever came in contact with, you know, knew any of these organizations are extremely compartmentalized. Right. I mean, you should know. Right. Yeah, absolutely. Well, this I was, mean, I mean, these guys were intelligent. The finders were intelligent people. Petty was not a slouch. I mean, he uh, and he was just like any other cult leader. He never really had a job. I think he said to uh, journalists, "Not unless you call being a cult leader full time employment. I haven't had any." <laughs> So he was probably just living off at least the pension. Where's all this money coming from? You know, so he's I got mean, he's got surreptitious money, supposedly from playing cards. Give me a break. I mean, they had relationships with, you know, the Moonies. They ran a gal, you know, they ran a gala for the Moonies at one time. The finders did. They met them and, you know, met yeah. Reverend Sung Young Moon. And, and uh, you know, they had many shell companies, you know, Future Enterprises, which is a computer trading company that trades CIA employees. Gung Ho Traders, which, you know, again, uh, fighters connections with China and their alleged child trafficking connections with China, too. Um, you know, they had this Gung Ho Trader company where there was like an import-export where Toby Trout talks about his book, The Game, Co- Game Caller, about how when they first went to San Francisco and got the warehouse, that um, they got a whole bunch of stuff from Chinatown that people were just throwing away and they may have ended up selling that. So they had a lot of shell companies, tons and tons yeah, of shell classic companies. Classic cult type stuff. Scientology is the same way. Uh, and same with the Moonies. They have tons of different... Uh, of course, the Moonies were connected to the Council for National Policy. The Republicans love the Moonies. <laughs> love it. They're good donors, you know? It's good donors. Um, now, one last finder of person I want to talk about, I want to see if I can find him, um, was... Uh, what was... His name was... Uh, Re- I think his name was Rios. Um, he was really big in polyamory. Hmm. And he was a member of the Finders? Yes, he was. I cannot... Well, let me see if I can find it. He, yes, he was a... He's very, very sketchy. And his... Um, okay, I found him. Uh, his name was Michael uh, Versance Rios. Uh, his, he was the son of the United States Army Colonel Humpart Joseph Versance. Uh, his mother was the author of the Fifteenth Pelican, a uh, Terry Rios, who became the tel- based on, which later became the television show The Flying Nun. Hmm. Um, so he, uh, f- while in high school, founded a polyamory co- commune known as the Community in the mid 1960s. That lasted for 30 years. Um, he co-founded many, su- several alternative schools and education programs in 19- early 1970s. And was had the first domestic hot, violence hotline in the United States. He also started a lot of computer retail stores and sold computers during the uh, early, late seventies, which is an early time for that. Very early, uh, absolutely. Um, in the early nineteen eighties, uh, he founded a social service agency and personally took in over a hundred teenage foster children. I'm looking into that currently. Um, and uh, so, yeah, he 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 runs this uh, intentional village now called the Allegheny Crest Intentional Village and this uh, thing called Center for New Culture, and it's just nothing about polyamory, which, you know, if you're adults and you're a libertine, fine. I, you know, I think it's kind of degenerate as a Christian, but, you well, know. It sounds but, like he's st- he's staying in the same vein he was in in the Finders, right? Probably he, corrupting yes. people, getting information. What do you think the full purpose of the Finders was? I don't know. Yeah. I, don't, like, I mean, I can like speculate. I can say that they were a front for the global, at least one arm of the global cabal to gain information and to traffic uh, children, allegedly, and sell child pornography, allegedly, and, you know, traffic information. I don't know about drugs, uh, traffic goods. Um, I mean, they were around a lot of the LSD people, the psychedelic movement, so I, I don't know. It's just, you know, like I said, when I first started this, I went in objectively and the more I've gotten now, I mean, if 
at this point, it's it, it's if anyone ever tells you, even me, if I ever say I exactly understand the finders, then I've been bought out. <laughs> Right. I can but, only go on the information that Right, I know. but the, the the information is super sketchy. I mean, they basically were it never is. prosecuted. It is. I the agree. FBI and the CIA squashed or quashed any kind of investigation. I'm just saying I'll never get down to the bottom of it, William. I don't, I don't think it'll ever end. Well, yeah. Well, Marion, you know, the guy is dead, so he, there's no way you're going to find much about him. And they didn't keep a, seem to keep a lot of records, and the guys who were talking about it clearly – aren't getting into the details of the the organizational structure and controls, you know? Oh, I mean, not, I mean, you know, what, what about, you know, Henry Tilden, Skip Clements, who, who, who said that, um, the fighters were involved with the, um, the Glendale Monastery school abuse case in the eighties. And that, um, you know, Henry Skip Clement, Clements claimed that he worked for the CIA and that, uh, many of his children were allegedly molested at the Glendary Monastery school in Stewart, Florida, and that the fighters were a part of it. And he actually talks about, that you know the finders having monastery schools in Kentucky, but then it later come out and and and, and it released those. It was, I mean, he may have been able to figure that out because it was in it was in a, a an obscure local newspaper that I wrote that I read that talked about that. Like he had to been doing some deep research to figure that out. Of course, the two people that brought it up were. You know, from my favorite North Carolina, uh, Senator Charles Rose, who has many connections to the CMP and to Rackgate, and just was definitely not our guy. And Tom Lewis, uh, who, when you know, he retired the same time Charles Rose did, like after this case was brought to the State Department, and then they were like, "Eh, we're not going to do anything about it." Um, uh, the guy who replaced Tom Lewis was Mark Foley. Right. Mark Foley. Who resigned later in the homosexual page scandal. Right, page scandal. He was sending all those texts. At least that's what they he probably was trying to do more than send the text, you know, but whatever. I will one day re- try to reach out to Henry Clements. I have found him nice. and tried to see if I can get information on. I've also uh, re-found the, the Tallahassee Police Department um, PR guy. Uh, I can't remember his name uh, at the time. And he worked at the Tallahassee Police Department for 20 years. But he, when I messaged him on LinkedIn, he did not get back to me. Yeah, it's been 30 years. You know, this is a very cold, cold type of case. To get all the details out of there would probably be very difficult. But, I mean, like I said, you know, it, when you look at all the – everything connected, there definitely were things going on for sure. Yeah, I would totally um, agree. And, and one last thing, you know, as much as I do appreciate Derek Bros's documentaries – I, it saddens me that he's bought into the whole satanic panic uh, narrative. Yeah. He should, as much as research he's done with Jeffrey Epstein, he should know a little bit more than that. Yeah. Well, um, I mean, some people get convinced by that. They think that it's a cover for child molestation. If you look at the landing report, that's the gist. Yeah, but I'm, no satanic the landing, crimes. The, you know about the landing report really Absolutely. well. You've read it, right? Absolutely. I did a I, whole show on the landing report i want i want to have you on my podcast uh after i do the landing report on refuting it with me because it's it's easily refutable yeah it's a joke uh he also sets up this very kind of supremely legalistic standard for what a a occult influence crime is that basically tantamount to like you got to have your nose held standing on one leg on a specific date in a specific time to have something influenced by the occult and it's absurd so if you can't abide by his extremely elevated standard then it's not a cult so even though you could say i'm doing this by the will of satan landing in the landing report standard would negate it but the gist of his report is that there's the occult crimes is people attributing things that are really just child abuse and and i don't believe that at all there's tons of occult criminals occult inspired criminals out there there's just a horn of them Oh, very, very much so. I mean, it's just ridiculous. Yeah, right. I mean, I, and that was one thing that sad me that he used to, you know, to term satanic panic, but didn't talk, you know, like bros kind of just like went lip wristed. And then when I contacted bros about a month or two before his documentary came out, and I was like, hey, I got information that you might find interesting. He kind of blew me off. Hmm. And I was like, well, okay, you know, fine, whatever. You know, so well, it there's is, a it very is what disturbing aspects of this case. There's rural stuff, kids, goat slaughter. I mean, pictures. What I find interesting is people in, There was something in there of people were were in like uh, ritual outfits, right? 
Well, yeah, mm-hmm. and Stuart Silverstone and his his girlfriend that were both in the Fighters Cult, they adored Aleister Crowley. Interesting. How did you I find mean, out about that? That's in Toby Terrell's book, The Game Caller. Oh, that's interesting. Well, that's perfect. That they were in the right cult. They probably, if they're in one of the cult like the Finders, if they really emulate Crowley, there's probably in, uh, involved in ten other cults as well. Well, they say the ex- again. They say the execution of Henry and Igor, where the children were there. They, they, the, 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 the the report, they say they were wearing robes. Toby Terrell claims they were aprons to protect to get their sure. clothes from getting dirty. Sure. Um, but the kids were there when they, you know, pulled the placenta out of Henrietta. And you, I mean, look, that's I get, totally normal. That's yeah. totally normal, John. Just and, get a three-year-old and, kid to watch a bloody slaughter of a goat. Yeah, sure. It, but that's what they claim. That is well, what they claim. Bo- it's, it's absurd. Um, where can people find your stuff? Where can people go you, on social media? Um, you tell, tell us where they can contact you if they have any other questions or want to follow up. Um, yeah, they can contact me at um, john at fixyourgut.com if they have any uh, emails or anything that they want to, to send to me about this information. And they can find me at Fix Your Gut. Um, john at fixyourgut.com, F-I-X-Y-O-U-R-G-U-T.com, correct? Yes. Gotcha. And do you have any other social media, Twitter, Facebook? Instagram, nah, Twitter? I mean, I got a Facebook for Fix Your Gut. Nothing for the stuff that I'm doing now. Gotcha. Um, uh, maybe in the future, we're doing a podcast called We Read the Documents. We've only recorded three episodes now. Right now, the first season is going to be on ritual uh, satanic abuse and the history of it. So far, for the past three episodes, we did the ancient history of you know sacrifices of the Mesopotamic area and religious religious aspects and you know ancient stuff and right. now the next episode we're getting into is the children of god cult which i've mm-hmm. my three main cases are the children of god cult hopefully one day we'll be little rascals and then the third is the finders um so i've done a lot of extensive research in, on all three of those things that's a great idea actually you can actually read the documents you know i mean that's it. yeah if you want to cover west memphis three you can go through the court cases and just yeah that's why i wanted to have you on for yeah. west memphis three three as well love, um, to be, love to be on in a second um but thank you for having me on william again i am a, a huge fan of your show Thanks, um man. and your of course the research that you've done the west west memphis free and you know the other research that you've done uh, done to as well is, is should be applauded oh, i appreciate um, it uh, but definitely thank you thank you for having me on john thanks so much i appreciate it. john brisson and we discussed the cult the finders thank you so much all right cool man Down.